Welcome to the 150th episode of Five Strike Weekly. More rumors and more matches to come in 2020. Will the new reinforcements help the current situation? We discuss all that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Strike Fam. I'm AJ and this is Mark. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Follow our Twitch for watch-alongs on match days on twitch.tv slash ATLUTD fan TV. It's a different time for Atlanta United fans nowadays, one that's really testing our patience. But what we have to realize is the front office is still ambitious, and despite some obvious missteps, Recently, we got to give them a chance to rectify their shortcomings. They've earned the headway, even if some of the personnel and the management are no longer the same. But with that being said, let's get into the match review. So it's a 4-2 loss against Nashville SC on Saturday. Uh, definitely, yeah, not uh, the, you know, not the match to watch if you are trying to get back into the five stripes for sure. Uh, and especially, you know, we've had a pretty good historic time against expansion sides, but uh, this one was just not our day. And that was from the outset. But before we get into the play, let's get into what the starting lineup looked like. It was Guzan in the sticks, uh, in between the sticks, Bello, Robinson, Walks, Escobar, Larry got the start, Hosetu, and Wolf got his uh, very first start, youngest start for an Atlanta United player. Barco, Lennon, and Adam John up top. Uh, Nashville, Willis, Lovitz, Romney, Zimmerman, McCarty, uh, Mukhtar, Johnston, Godoy, Moyle, Donlad and Baji, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they essentially they scored in the very first minute. Uh, Dominic Baji, you know, he got on the end of uh, you know something in uh, from a corner, and uh, it's just you know just a little bit uh, you know where it's been a uh, an Achilles heel for LA United. I mean, we uh, throughout this match. It's, you know, whether it's a set piece, whether it's um, a corner, whether it's, you know, just a, a dead ball situation, we have not been good. And, you know, I think this, uh, this uh, kind of, you know, it, it reared its ugly head again. But uh, before we get into the, like the in-depth, in-depth, like what were your thoughts, Mark, like directly after watching this match? Um, I mean, the players alluded to it, but definitely the giveaways, you know, it was just so sloppy, so sloppy in midfield, so sloppy in defense. Um, terrible way to start the match, obviously, you know, it kind of goes without saying, but then also Nashville, you know, and we talked about it at the beginning of the season, you know, Nashville has a kind of a stout defense and I think uh, coming into this match, they had four clean sheets on the season already. And so when you give up the early goal against a team like Nashville, you know, it's always going to be difficult. I mean, yes, Atlanta equalized, but, you know, just the sloppy, sloppy play in its ugly head. And, you know, like you could see Stephen Glass trying to rotate. I mean, he has to with these matches being essentially it's three matches a week, right? But it just seems like we're so shot, you know, like it doesn't really seem like he has a lot of players he can rely on. I mean, like, overall, I'm not going to single out any player too much to play because I think uh, in general is a pretty poor team performance, but it does also seem like it just, you know, there aren't really a whole lot of players that Steven Glass can rely on. And so it's, um, yeah, it's just real sloppy. Like that's, that's the word that I keep coming back to. Right. Uh, and we'll get to what Steven Glass uh, also talked about in terms of uh, how it wasn't at the required standard either but uh yeah i mean you know nashville they pretty much put put up three unanswered goals on us uh and it was just insurmountable at the end uh there was some fight back uh larry got a goal um 
off of a, I don't, it depends if he even really got, uh, <laughs> you know, contact on it or not. But, you know, that's a whole right, other thing. Right. Uh, Barco. It's one of those Harry Kane goals. Yeah, right. But Barco free kick, I mean, he, he looked like he did. He, he took credit for it. So that's, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll mm -hmm. assume everyone, that he yeah, did. Everyone celebrated with him. So. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely, I think, you know, one of the few bright spots in this match, of course, uh, one where there weren't a ton. Uh, I mean, this arguably is possibly a low point uh, for the club for sure as well in terms of losing to a, an expansion side uh, that really looked pretty anemic going forward and then giving up four goals. Uh, that's definitely their biggest win in their history. Uh, this is a scalp for them for sure even though I think there are yeah. significant asterisks to uh, to apply to this as well. But, uh, you know, at least for our season anyway. But, um, but anyway, uh, moving on from that, uh, you know, George Bello, I think also, uh, you know, was one of the other bright spots. He had a well-struck goal. Uh, 61st minute, you know, trying to kind of, bring us back a little closer, pull a, a goal back. Um, yeah, I mean, he got in the, the box well. Uh, Adam John found him on definitely one of our uh, you know best team goals of the year. And um, yeah, he finished it like a plum. Just, you know, I think very cool in the box. Put it inside the post. Exactly. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, Bello... Uh, you know, I think he's been growing this season, and I think that's at least one of the, the I think, highlights of this, uh, this just really, uh, you know, dim kind of season, you know, uh, to describe this season at the, just, you know, in a few words, but I, I think, though, you know, that's, that's unfair to maybe just, you know, call this season that way when... Yes, there are still 12 games to play, so there is still, you know, a lot to play for. And yeah. so, if we can get it together, there so far, is. It's, uh, it's been a struggle. Yeah, it's been a struggle. Yeah, that's a that's a good word for that. But, yeah. um, you know, and essentially, you know, we, we won't like just get into the dredges of this match because it's obviously not a whole lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> I mean, essentially, you know, Nashville tear us up when they look just completely uh you know inept in front of goal and you know there are moments where it's just uh how did that go you know go goal go in um there's a dribbler that goes past brad guzan that definitely should have done better on it's you know there's a flurry of just each and every one of these goals there's like very obvious mistakes slash you know we could have absolutely done better and so uh you know it could be yeah. where i mean yeah, go ahead yeah i would say you know like if you know taking the match in sequence you know obviously so they uh get a corner within the first minute and score and i mean like it's like three or four national players in the box versus uh, i think about seven atlanta defenders and so the fact that mccarty can uh get to that ball first you know and then it's just a tap in for i think it's uh is it Baji? no Mukhtar. yeah i mean like you know it just that's just horrible defending um but i thought the response after that was decent i thought mm -hmm. um the play after that was okay particularly from fellow going down the left and i think that uh to kind of uh add to what you were saying about bello i like seeing the chemistry with him and barco down the left side you know you see the overlap and then barco you know cuts in from the left uh which was effective at first but i think after a while it got predictable because he was really the main threat um but I thought that play was encouraging. And the free kick that sets up Atlanta United's goal is George Bello. You know, it's a ball over the top. George Bello is brought down. So, you know, aside from uh, the team goal towards the end, well, not the end of the match, but obviously the last goal, um, I thought that that was probably, that was 15 minutes about thereabouts was probably the brightest spot for Atlanta. But then right. it goes downhill quickly. I mean, you got Nashville's next goal comes off of a throw-in. You know, like, that's what's just one of those mm, pet peeve goals, man. 
Like right. you should never throw the ball directly to the other team. That's exactly what happened. It was almost like an assist from Escobar. And then uh and then the the Nashville's third goal is a giveaway from uh from Lennon. You know, he's trying to find Escobar down the right side, gives the ball away, and then honestly Lennon gets cooked. And it was it was so yeah. it was just so simple, you know, it's just just watching that stuff is just really, really frustrating. And so, like, you're down three one, going into halftime, and you're up against it, and you you essentially gave away those three goals. I think that it's just it's incredibly disheartening. Yeah, and uh, you know everyone is culpable. I think in this match for sure uh, on the defensive side, uh, Larry didn't cover himself in glory, uh, trying to uh, cover Mukhtar. Uh, yeah, as he spoke about Lennon, uh, yeah, he gets turned left, right, left. I mean, he doesn't know where his, uh, attacker is at any point, really. I feel yeah, like. it never gets close. No, and, uh, and that's, it's a yeah, pretty embarrassing play there. But, uh, you know, we also have to realize, yes, he's more of a winger who is, uh, you know, trying to do a job, uh, more so when he tracks back, but, um, you know, and so, you know, throughout this match, it's, uh, you know, there's some fight back, but then, you know, I think at the latter part of this match, it's just, it's, there's nothing happening. It's, uh, it's pretty much, uh, players that are playing without any bravery. They're not, uh, you know, really believing in themselves, uh, to take any risks going forward. And, uh, it's painfully obvious. It, was yeah painful to see also and uh you know it's just i think it it's that uh compounding you know you know kind of uh bad form and no one wants to be the uh you know no one wants to be the uh the worst guy on the pitch but they all end up being the the worst worst uh, on the pitch i mean they're definitely second best to everything uh and that's just you know i think um, kind of the, at the end of the day, you know, that's what it is. It's them not, uh, you know, no, them no longer believing in themselves because of, uh, you know, what's transpired recently. And, you know, they need to find it quick because there's still a lot of matches to play. And, uh, you know, these 12 matches could really define, uh, you know, how they're looked at as players going forward as well because if they're you know just uh, guys that give up on the the season you know that early it's you know it'd be it'd be awful obviously for for all parties involved but but um i think uh mm -hmm. another thing you know like you look at the position right and again it's 60 40 atlanta they've been having the majority of possession in most of these games but isn't you know you'll you've heard me make this point before and I hate to repeat myself, but, you know, it's one of those things where our attack is just not putting fear into other teams. You know, I mean, like we get the ball up to the final third and then it slows down. You know, you have Barco trying to cut in, you know, or, um, you know, you, the ball gets up there and then goes backwards. And it's just like it's easy for Nashville to defend. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, they they kind of grow into the game and then they're more confident in winning the ball in midfield, winning the ball high and then attacking quickly. You know, and so I just think, just think it's just a thing, you know, where teams don't, aren't really fearing allowing goals from Atlanta. And so they, you know, they grow into the match, they push up more and then they eventually, you know, essentially they put the press pressure back on Atlanta. And so it's, you know, I think you saw that again today or not, the, you know, on the weekend, on Saturday, I think yeah. you saw that again. In the match. Yeah. 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 And I, I think, you know, uh, to use the cliche, it's a toothless performance. It's, uh, yes. one where we're lacking cutting edge. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it's, I think it's obvious that the, these players, um, they lack the creativity to break down uh, sides right now. And, yes. and that's uh, something that, you know, maybe we need to change in terms of how we're setting up and wanting to play. Uh, maybe we give up the ball a little bit more and, uh, you know, try to take a little bit more risks so that, you know, okay, if we do lose it, okay, uh, you know, where are we on the pitch? Uh, do we want to be 
a little bit more of a, you know, a lower block. You know, it'll be something that uh, they'll have to assess and see if they actually, you know, want the ball more or, uh, you know, or not. But, uh, so let's get to uh, some of the, the team notes from this match. Uh, Larry keeps la racking up the uh, appearances lately. Uh, this is his 4 and 28th MLS regular season appearance. He's just behind Kyle Beckerman at 490. Uh, and this was the 41st goal of his MLS career, which, I mean, you know, pretty decent for a... Uh, kind of a high you know, number, yeah. Yeah, pretty high number for a uh, kind of deep-lying midfielder. But uh, throughout most of his career, yeah, a little bit, he played more kind of box-to-box uh, -box earlier in his career. But I think during the past uh, latter part of the decade, he's been more of a, you know, defensive midfielder. Uh, Bellow scored his first goal of the season and second of his MLS career. Of course, that first one came against New England Revolution a couple of years ago. And yes, I uh, alluded to that uh, earlier, but Tyler Wolf uh, made his first start, and he's at 17 years old in two months. Uh, and so he's the fourth youngest, actually, player to start in MLS this season. And actually was the second youngest player to start a league match in club history. That's, of course, George Bellow. Uh, so let's get into the negatives of this match. Uh, we kind of pretty much covered a lot of it, but uh, defense was definitely all over the shop. Uh, the balls over the top we couldn't cope with. The set piece defense couldn't uh, cope with uh, you know them as well. And just the lack of chances created in the second half, especially in the latter part of it. So uh, let's get into some of yeah. the... I mean, not... Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, real quick, yeah, Nashville's fourth goal comes from a ball over the top, and it's right after Rometty subs on. So it's like you have that, you know, break, and then Nashville just, you know, skips the midfield, and it's it's so easy, you know? But yeah. So, it, all it's ridiculously easy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, sure, you know, you had uh, someone in your line change, but it's, yeah, you definitely have to, you have to, yeah, get up to speed as quickly as possible when you get into a match but definitely yeah you got skipped over but uh so let's get into the post match quotes uh first up is uh steven glass talking about how he dressed the team after the match i think this is really telling I, he said i think i did a lot of my talking at halftime rather than after the game we had a good discussion after the game i think the players know the standards required and they know there is no excuse for the performance level tonight we win and we lose as a group obviously I think there's a lot of people that know they didn't come up to the required standard to play for the club tonight. And he went on to say, uh, on if this feels like a gut check moment for the team, he said, yeah, I wouldn't uh, so much use the term uh, checkpoint, but rather it's a reality check. And if you don't do the basic things well, or if clear instructions are not followed and people decide to do what they want, to do rather than what the team needs them to do, then the team finds himself in trouble. The reality check is that the work rate needs to stay really high. The following instructions needs to happen. And if you if you can't play for 45 minutes and expect to beat anyone, that's the reality check. There's obviously a good number of games coming up. If we can start getting points on the board, we need to get in the playoffs. The opportunity is still there, but there's zero for the level tonight in my eyes. And, yeah, I mean, I think throughout the match you could hear uh, at times Stephen Glass yelling at the players to either run or uh, follow some of his instructions. But, I mean, I guess that fell on deaf ears because it obviously was not happening. And uh, I don't know if that's a sign of some kind of trouble uh, within, uh, you know, the locker room and in training. Not sure. I mean, obviously, he's still a uh, newer head coach in that sense, so he's still trying to, uh, you know, figure out how to be able to communicate on a regular basis uh, with his players. But um, yeah. so I will yeah, go say, ahead. you know, like I think he's doing the job of an interim coach. You know what I mean? Right. Like it's it's a mess right now, and I think that most managers would probably uh, struggle with this group. So I think. Um, you know, I like hearing this from him, you know, trying to set a standard, basically. Um, I think that yeah, these players probably do need to hear some tough words and need to remember, you know, uh, you got to play with pride. 
you know like it just i feel like that's something that kind of jumped off the page um or just jumped off the screen rather in terms of watching that match it's just like it didn't feel like you know they were uh representing the uniform so it just right. i think uh i think steven glass is doing some important work right now even if his uh title is only interim he's doing important work for whatever next manager that Atlanta united brings in right yeah and I, I like that he's challenging the players as well because uh right now you know maybe you could coddle these egos and whatnot but i think uh you know there is something of uh a thing to be said for you know not only uh making sure that these guys know that they need to up their their level but uh you know know that if they're not playing well enough on the pitch uh and in training they won't be picked and so you know, that needs to kind of put the fear of God in them a little bit as well. But um, So uh, Jeff Lorenowitz talked about uh, on if uh, they can use any of his or, you know, the team can use any of his experience to help galvanize the group. He said, of course, I've been on bad teams for sure. You have to play our, your way out of it. If you don't, it gets worse. It compounds. Each game gets worse. You don't want to come into training. It's also something that his club has never done. And I don't see us doing this year. We have to work our way out of it. We have plenty of talent, plenty of ability on the field, but we can't allow ourselves to get to that place. It's strange the way the scheduling has gone because you can only look so far ahead because you have no idea what's coming around the corner in terms of games and scheduling. But we do know, seem to know, that there will be 12 more games. We have to believe that there, uh, that those will happen and we'll have ample opportunity to work ourselves up and work our way out of it. I think that's, yeah, super important that they don't let it compound. I mean, you know, pretty much take each game at a time like the cliche is. But, you know, it's, I think, very important because uh, really forget what happened last match. Uh, in a sense where, you know, what went wrong, but do find those uh, things that, you know, you can work on to get better for each match, and hopefully, you know, these players can get, you know, work their way out of this, because I think that is the uh, the important part of this, is uh, Larry is, you know, obviously very experienced, Guzan very experienced, but everybody else pretty much lacks that really, uh, you know, past maybe four years uh you know everyone yeah. is pretty much very inexperienced so and some of them haven't gone through this before exactly and, uh, i think that's something that you know they'll have to lean on you know players like this that have uh gone through these really tough times because uh, god knows he's been on some uh some bad teams as well but um, yeah, but... right. I, and one thing, you know, I, I, a theme that I'm getting from these comments too that I like is that the season isn't over. And so, like, you know, you hear, you know, the cliche, it can't get any worse. Well, it can. I mean, we could lose every game. We could finish last. We could not make the playoffs. It'd be embarrassing if we didn't finish in the top 10 in the East. Like, you know, that would be a real low point. So I think it's important, you know, to not have the attitude of, ah, well, to hell with the season. No, there's plenty of games left, you know. And so, like, um, there needs to be some sort of bar that's set basically that like look we can turn this around this is where we want to get to and then we'll go from there so absolutely well uh, let's wrap a bow on this match and let's get into the news so uh, we now know that there are three more Atlanta United matches in the season and Inter Miami again on September 19th at the Benz uh, will happen. We will have the preview for you later in this show. And uh, the next match is FC Dallas at home September 23rd and then at Chicago Fire on September 27th. So, I mean, it's uh, at least we see a couple of different faces. So that's nice. But, uh, I mean, Inter Miami again. I guess yeah, we uh, we have to do some some rectifying of our uh, our situation right now because they're technically they're undefeated against us at the moment, and so we can't have that. We can't have uh, you know that kind of situation against an expansion side for sure. Yeah, the what, the last place team in the East. Like we've got to get at least a point out of this match. Exactly. Uh, so. Uh, you know the new MLS Cup playoff format has been also announced. 
It will be single elimination matches hosted by the higher seeded team, and the competition will follow a straight bracket format through MLS Cup through to December 12th. Uh, there will be 18 total clubs in the MLS Cup playoffs, 10 from the East, 8 from the West. Uh, the top eight teams qualify directly to round one in the Western Conference. In the Eastern Conference, it's a little bit more complicated because there are 10. Uh, only the top six seeds qualify directly to round one. Seeds seven through 10 will complete in a or compete in a playoff match. And uh, it will be number seven against number 10, number eight against number nine. And that lowest seed uh, playing winner will advance to play the number one seed in the East. And then the highest seed playing winner will advance to the number one or number two seed in the West. So a bit complicated there. Uh, you can replay it uh, if you need to, to, uh, <laughs> to fully understand that. But essentially, I mean, yeah, we would be right now in one of those spots. Uh, most likely, yeah, playing if we are 10th and we stay 10th, uh, you know, let's, you know, uh, pretend that we're in this situation. Uh, and the number number seven seed, uh, we'd play away. And so, and then if we somehow were able to, uh, you know, uh, advance, then we would play uh, the number one seed in the East. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something where we want to be out of these places. We don't want to play an extra game that definitely, uh, you know, exposes maybe our depth a little bit, which I think... Uh, Mark has been talking about where, yeah, I mean, you know, there there is, I think, uh, a little bit shallower depth in terms of uh, who you can rely on week in, week out. But um, so moving on from that, uh, let's get into the transfer rumors from this week. And last week we talked about Marcelino Moreno. Well, there's an update in uh, that uh, Cesar Merlo uh, and TYC Sports said that Moreno is reportedly very close to becoming a player for Atlanta United. And Lanus is, uh, you know, they have have progressed the possible transfer and they just want a sell-on clause uh, with a percentage. We don't know what the percentage is yet, but uh, I'm sure there will be some reports on it. Uh, and that the deal could be completed at the end of the week. And, you know, that means maybe next week we could uh, hear... A uh, an announcement, maybe if uh, you know, if uh, they decide maybe to do it that way, they could also decide that they want to have a little bit of pop and circumstance, so they want to film a an intro video and other stuff, and so it might take a little longer. There might be a quarantine. Yeah, you really never know. But uh, yeah, in terms of uh, the type of player, I mean, we talked about him last week, but essentially, uh, he can play central midfielder. And also on the wings, which is obviously, you know, not the most traditional way you hear about players. Uh, you more so hear them if, uh, you know, they can play across the, the front line and, uh, you know, OK, they can play as an attacking midfielder on the left, on the right, in the middle. But uh, this is seems more like, yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, uh, you know, can actually play a little bit more as a kind of box to box. Uh, definitely has a, a good work rate. Uh, loves to dribble at players. He's got something like an eight, uh, eight something uh, kind of take ons per match. Uh, that's a lot, actually, and uh, it's yeah, great. It is, yeah. I think, because it's yeah. something. That, yeah, we, we need someone that can a can be able to break down teams. Um, and I think, yeah, without a Nagby, uh, you have someone maybe you know along with Barco, along with Hosetsu that can do some of that work. But he's also, I think, uh, in terms of what I've seen from him, uh, pretty direct at times as well. And can dribble himself out of pressure. Uh, and then, you know, yes, obviously, his, you know, uh, kind of in-product stats aren't spectacular in that league. And we've talked about it uh, last week as well, that, you know, the likes of Miguel Miron and Jose Martinez didn't come in to the league with uh, kind of glowing stats either. So... You know, it really just kind of depends on also systems and how they uh, are used by their coach and, uh, you know, within games. And so, you know, obviously, uh, if we, you know, try to integrate him a little bit more like, uh, you know, to his strengths, then, 
you know, we might get a little bit more in product out of him. But, um, you know, there's uh, there's an interesting wrinkle in that, though. Uh, according to Julie Michelis and uh, TYC Sports again, uh, another transfer rumor, this time for a U-17 goalkeeper uh, for the Argentina U-17s anyway, uh, Rocco Rios Novo. He's a youth goalkeeper of Lanús as well, and he reportedly could be included in the deal with Moreno. Uh, he's an 18-year-old, and he could go on loan with an option to buy for $3 million. And So, uh, obviously, that's uh, exciting in a sense uh, for a goalkeeper to be brought in uh, that uh, could be highly rated, $3 million, that's uh, obviously a you know, pretty decent fee, especially in MLS as well for a uh, youth goalkeeper but uh you know that means the valuation at least is uh, pretty high in that regard uh on transfer market he's uh he's worth about 743,000 but that's of course you know transfer market kind of a, a starting point uh, but he also is a dual citizen of both the United States and Argentina so born in Los Angeles so that means he possibly if uh if he gets to the first team, he wouldn't require an international spot. So that's very, very, uh, I think, uh, future thinking in a sense as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, Novo, uh, you know, part of the U-17 Argentina squad as well. I think, you know, there's uh, some really big promise here because of just how, you know, I think, you know, progressed you have to be to uh, to make these uh, Argentina U-17s as well. So promising prospect for sure if uh, that does indeed become part of the deal uh, but let's uh, let's get into the head coach rumors that don't exist uh, <laughs> <laughs> but basically president Dar uh, Darren Eels uh, you know he told reporters in July that uh, you know they weren't going to rush it uh, they're not going to get who whoever's available this minute and uh, you know they will take their time because uh, yeah, you know, they want to get the right person in to lead the club going forward on a permanent basis. And so, yeah, currently so far, there are no head coach rumors and, you know, obviously frustrating, but it's also, uh, you know, it's kind of part and parcel right now. It's, uh, you know, they, uh, they want to do their due diligence that they possibly, uh, didn't do after the 2018 MLS Cup. Like, Mark, uh, has mentioned plenty of times it's it's something that you know the team might have rushed that that job they you know or rushed that search because you know uh tata martino i think they were banking on him they were banking on him to yeah. come or stay Thank so. so at least one more year but uh anyway let's move on to eric lopez and he is finally training with la united at least in photos he's I think been reported that he has been training with the first team uh, for a couple of weeks at least. But uh, photos have finally come out, and he will be wearing number 16. Uh, of course, Heidman was wearing that number last season, and before him, Chris McCann. So, yeah, it's kind of been just sitting dormant for a season. Uh, obviously, maybe not the you know obvious kind of forward number but i think you know as a squad player as he's gonna have to be at the moment uh even though he comes with a lot of promise i think that's a you know that shows i think you know something's moving <laughs> as well uh right. the fact that they released some photos uh allowed him to post it in that sense too you know uh right. obviously we're waiting on a front office move uh for him yeah. to be able to open up a roster spot something is maybe bubbling and so it's uh at yeah least... i mean you know like all right yeah no like i alluded to before with the uh seeming lack of depth i mean he would really help i you know it's the situation is getting a little frustrating you know because they obviously paid a uh, sizable by mls standard sizable transfer fee for him and so he seems to have a lot of potential and promise and like we could use some good players right now so i really hope that I really hope he features this season and like with enough time to like make an impact, you know, get, get his feet wet and then be able to make a proper impact by the end of the season. Right. Cause yeah, if, uh, if he can't get into the first team and he, you know, has to play with LA United too, it would, 
it's not exactly the best look for the club either you know it'd be broken promises and so there'd be some obvious frustration from the player and uh from optics as well i think but um uh, yeah, so uh, moving on from that, Joseph Martinez has also been seen doing some individual dribbling work, uh, this time a little bit further away with the cones in uh, more of a kind of uh, kind of delta fo uh, formation with the cones. And uh, great to see. I mean, I think, you know, him putting uh, just more, uh, more weight on his knee. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's six months. Uh, maybe some would argue that he should be more ahead, but I think, you know, he just needs to take the his sweet time, really. I mean, so, yeah. and like I said last week, you guys are terribly mean if uh, you guys are still ragging on his weight. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, again, <laughs> you try not doing cardio for, you know, uh, essentially six months, like real cardio, and, you know, you you show where you're at and uh, be brave enough to, you know, run around without your shirt off or your shirt on. It's uh... Listen, I've definitely gained a quarantine 20 at least. So <laughs> no banter for me. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Uh, I've, I've been trying to work out a little bit more uh, diligently throughout the, the time. I think, well, I had a roommate move out. And so I kind of been using their space as a kind of workout room and it's been great. So it's uh... a, <laughs> It's one of those things where, you, yeah, I know, right? Exactly. I've, I've been trying to stay diligent, but I understand that most people are not in that type of situation where they have, uh, maybe the, uh, the want and also the the space to do it. So, but um, but anyway, so moving on, Franco Escobar, he uh, said on Twitter that uh, quote, "If in bad times you leave, in good times we don't need you." Obviously, a little bit shrouded in maybe what he's talking about it, but I think uh, it's I think clear to me at least that he's talking about fans. He's maybe been getting some hate uh, here and there uh, across social media, but uh, I think you know at the end of the day, he's an Atlanta United player. He's a guy that has uh, given heart and soul for the team, and you know I think absolutely, yeah, absolutely, you know preaching what he's saying here you know fairweather fans you know goodbye it's just one of those things where uh you know if you're a fan of this team just be there through the the tough and the good times as well i mean that's just what he's saying so yeah um but yeah. Mm -hmm, go ahead oh yeah i mean you know now you know i you, you and i remember what uh 2018 was like and i think uh Part of the reason why this team uh, grew as quickly as it, you know, did in terms of popularity is because, you know, a lot, a lot of y'all were our Atlanta sports fans. You know, we're used to that disappointment. I grew up a DC sports fan. I'm definitely used to disappointment and losing. So for a team to come in, hit the ground running, and deliver so quickly, you know, I'll never forget that, and I'll always be grateful for that. Uh, so in terms of like following a bad team, you know. That's part. That's just, you know been here before. You know, and I think that I think for a real fan, th this can be. I guess it's it's when you build character. You know what I mean? Like you find out about certain players. You uh, that's when you really develop a love for the team. Is when you watch those bad games and um, you kind of stick it out with them. So I, I you know I, I definitely get where Escobar is coming from. We also have to remember these players have social media. They probably they probably catch a lot of hate that we don't even see. So um, I definitely understand where he's coming from. But I think it's also like you know you just gotta appreciate it in the moment, whether it's good, whether it's bad. You gotta appreciate it in the moment, man. At the end of the day, sports is a luxury. You know, like mm -hmm. this is not you know like there are so many other things going on. Like this part is the easy part to me so yeah <laughs> um but definitely definitely understand where he's coming from though yeah i mean as a long-suffering arsenal fan and braves <laughs> fan i mean it's just it's kind of part and parcel of sports but with that caveat you do hold the team accountable yes. uh, i don't think you abuse any of the players or the you know the team in general in that sense but you do yeah you make sure that you know they are doing the right things and so far you know at least 
what they're saying they're trying to get themselves out of it. Like I said at the top right. of the show. Uh, whether mm -hmm. if they do or not, well, if they don't, then, well, yeah, I mean, there might be some calls for them to be let go. And so, you know, that's just kind of part of it as well. But uh, so let's move on. And PT Martinez started for the first time for Al Nasser. Uh, he got an assist on a free kick into the box. Uh, it was a header that uh, was scored into the, uh, the near corner. And, uh, yeah, I mean, PT Martinez uh, getting his first start, that's, you know, something that, uh, and in terms of uh, getting an assist, you know, it, it maybe hurts to see a little bit, but, you know, I think we know that, you know, PT Martinez is a good player. Maybe the league's a little oh. bit different, uh, and he's maybe able to shine a little bit you know, quicker there because of that, possibly, but... Yeah, Ron uh, from Parceros posted a video of the assist. It was a free kick on the left flank. Uh, it, it was about 40 yards to the box, maybe 40 or 50 yards. It was a beautiful ball, like, bent. Uh, I guess it's bending away from the goalie, but, uh, I mean, just just perfect. I mean, like, man, but we know that PD has that quality. Like, I've said that before. Like, I've never had doubts that PD is a good player. It just didn't work out here. But, you know, it's not surprising for me to see him have that impact uh, in that league and really for any team in general. Right. Uh, so, moving on from that, LA United 2, they lost 2 1 to Miami as well last Saturday. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, obviously different team, but I mean, they've been playing Miami as well. I think they're. It was maybe uh, two weeks ago where we were playing Miami and LA United 2 was also playing a Miami. Uh, obviously, they're not uh, affiliated. They're not, uh, you know, part of the same organization. But, uh, yeah, they will, LA United 2, look to get their third uh, win of the season on Wednesday against Tampa Bay Rowdies, who have played them very, very tough. Uh, this will be the final meeting of the season between them. But, uh, yeah, Tampa Bay has won the three previous meetings this year. Hopefully, Yeah, they're they one can... of the better teams at that level, so it's, it, that is a tough matchup. It's, uh, they're one of the veteran sides as well, so it's, it's difficult uh, all around. They, you know, uh, Elaine and I, too, are basically fielding academy players uh, for a lot of the, the positions on the pitch. And, uh, yeah, one of them is academy player uh, Ajani Fortune, who... Uh, was able to score his first professional goal last time out. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, he became the fourth uh, current academy player to find the back of the net for Atlanta this season. So, you know, the, the academy is doing bits as well in that sense, maybe not getting the results, but they are developing these guys. But uh, that does it for the news and uh, gets us to a little bit of housekeeping. And that's follow our Twitch for match day watch alongs every single match day and stick around for the fan camps afterwards as well. There's lots of content all week. So head to twitch.tv slash ATL UTD fan TV and follow today or check out the description below for the link. So uh, that gets us to the mailbag and you guys send in these questions through IG story. Please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. But first question comes from not Nate Whipple. What a name there. Uh, <laughs> he asks, or they ask, if you could bring back one player that we sold, who would it be? Gressel for me. Uh, well, since there's no caveats on this question, I think the answer is Miggy easily, you know, like, but we've seen how good he is. He obviously belongs in the Premier League. More realistically, I'd probably say Tito, you know, like, you know, he has all his, uh, his flaws and criticisms. He has that element that we are currently missing, you know, like, um, I know it's kind of being a dead horse to make this point what we could, you know, we definitely... We definitely could use that explosiveness now, you know, but it is what it is. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, of course, I think it's talking to Nagby, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is there, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. I mean, but I'll answer the question. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, next question that comes from uh, German. Where do you think Atlanta will finish in the table by the end of the season? 
Yeah, uh, I'm gonna say that eighth, ninth range. You know, like I, I hope we don't drop anymore. I hope we're able to stabilize results a little bit. Um, but to see us climb the table, it just seems like such a tall task for the team right now. So I think we'll finish in that uh, in those playing spots. Yeah, I think uh, for me, and the, the the question actually came from Kerman, the Q, actually. But uh, yeah, for me, I. I have a little bit more hope. Uh, I think maybe the DP or whomever, if he's, if he's a DP or not, but Moreno, if he's brought in, uh, I think he can really help us. Uh, and if we can bring in Eric Lopez as well to help us, I think in these uh, last 12 matches, uh, we might get some momentum. And I think uh, we can maybe finish as high as seventh. So, uh, you know, hopefully we do. And, you know, you never know what could happen the rest of the season but you know this is with the information we have currently to be able to say that they're going to finish in the spots that we set uh next question that comes from danny phantom uh he asks has there been any new info regarding the coach position so obviously we talked about it earlier but you know uh just to reiterate slightly is that uh yeah the front office is not going to rush the search for the head coach position and uh so far there have been zero rumors after you know the first what this has been like what two months now the, after the <laughs> after the first three weeks there haven't been any rumors like i think even the first three weeks it was more people floating rumors about uh yeah. coaches yeah. that could be a fit and there really hasn't been at all yeah, there's no strong rumors, but uh, I am... So, Felipe tweeted this this morning. Apparently, it's a quote from Miguel Herrera, translated, of course. I've made my career, and I'll always have a job. I hope to stay at America, but if I have to go because of results, it's very likely that another team will give me a job. And so, I'm, for me, that's just juicy. Like, I would take Miguel Herrera in a heartbeat. Um, another coach I, I admire is uh, Matias Almeida. We've talked about him a lot on this podcast. And San Jose is struggling right now. Uh, I do feel like his style, his up-tempo man-marking style could work with uh, with this group. I think we would have to add to the group as well for him, but I think that's going to happen regardless. And so those are two coaches that, for me personally, I'm keeping my eye on. I would be delighted with either of those hires, but right. in terms of strong and rumors. Right. And th those are uh, very realistic ones, I think, as well, because Miguel Herrera, uh, of course, uh, manager of Club America right now, but the fans and maybe you know other people have been uh, on his back, and that's maybe why he felt compelled to make that statement today. Uh, and I think also in that regard, uh, there uh, we have played them before, obviously, and uh, there have been, I think, kind of uh, you know not only photos of Darren Eels sitting next to Miguel Herrera. But uh, you know there has been mutual <laughs> admiration as well. It's uh, it's it could be something that uh, you know there's no smoke, yeah. but it's like hmm, hmm, makes you think. Yeah, but, just start it. <laughs> yep. So uh, Josh Hertz twenty asks if we sign Moreno, where else in the team do you think we need to strengthen? So I mean, like from what I've been hearing from Moreno, again, like I haven't seen him play much, but he seems like. Like you mentioned before, like a box-to-box -box type, definitely all-carrying midfielder type. I think we need more up top, man. Like, I just, uh, you know, I'd like to see Lopez play, um, but it really does seem like we're just lacking in the attack. That uh, that incision, um, that sharpness, you know, it's just not there. So another forward that could help, I think, uh, I would like to see Atlanta in the market for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's someone... I think uh, definitely in the midfield. I mean, whether, uh, you know, Moreno is kind of the guy that uh, helps us connect a little bit more, but also uh, can contribute in the final third. I think it's, uh, we need, you know, someone that will be the, the future of, you know, kind of the defensive midfielder position. And so, you know, obviously without a, a head coach, a lot of people are like, clamoring for we have to have someone in before you know we uh bring in players but they're also trying to figure out the rest of the season as well they can always move on players that they bring in as well if uh you know they bring them on at reasonable cost so 
They'll uh, they'll be trying to figure and uh, kind of play that game essentially. Uh, next question comes from Semmer Seven. Semmer Seven asks, if a new goalkeeper comes in, how will Brad's spot be affected, or even uh, Alex Alex Hans? So, I mean, Brad just turned thirty six last week. You know, I think that he probably has like a couple more seasons at most. So, I think it's smart for Atlanta United to be looking to their next goalkeeper, and I think that. You know, getting a keeper when he's young and grooming him is probably the best way to go about it. In terms of Khan, I mean, I think he's there for now. You know, I mean, uh, especially if we're looking at somebody who's 18 years old, I think you still want a veteran backup. Um, as far as backups go, I think Khan is probably one of the better keepers in the league and he seems happy. So um, unless he suggests that he wants out, I don't think, I don't see a reason to necessarily move him on. Right. And uh, yeah, I think. You know, if Rios uh, Novos does come, I th- it really, I don't think it really affects Brad or uh, Can. Uh, it's just one of those things where, uh, you know, they're far, far more experienced. We're not going to go with an inexperienced goalkeeper uh, as of yet during a, uh, a year where if we're struggling and we're still trying to be ambitious, like that won't be something that will, uh, you know, will help us necessarily uh, get to the playoffs and or you know make a deep run into the playoffs with a uh, kind of newer goalkeeper so it uh, doesn't affect it too hard in my opinion next question comes from sheaves 77 how is it that a team like sounders can be consistent every year and we can't um yeah they've been at it for a little bit longer i think they already got into the league in what 2011 um around there but uh, you know the i think the manager is a big part of that uh you know he's been around for a while and i think also their style is a big part of that too you know they do yes they have their identity it's not the most attractive but um year in year out you know what to expect from the sounders they've also typically always had one of the better squads you know, back in the day they had oba femi martins you know right now they have raul Ru- 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 Diaz, I believe. Mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> that's a it's yeah, it's two R names that are very similar. Yeah, it's yeah. Right. But uh but no, I mean I think that's, you know, Seattle's just into on paper, they've they're usually one of the better teams in the league. They have a set identity. Their manager hasn't changed in a long time. So I think um they they really are one of the better organizations in MLS. And so I think that's that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, but it's also that. I mean, consistent. I mean, I think they are also known as a team that might start off kind of poorly to, you know, start a season and then make a really, really uh, almost cataclysmic uh, rise in the second part of a, a season. And so, you know, consistency, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder as well. And know that, yeah, not every club is built the same. Uh, this is our first year of kind of, you know, really big inconsistency in that sense where, um, well, one could say we're consistently struggling this season. But uh, <laughs> right. but uh, it's definitely, I think, at the end of the day, you know, Seattle Sounders, you know, they have, I think, you know, I, I believe they only, they've only had two coaches their, uh, their entire uh, existence in terms of in MLS. So... You know, through that, I think you have, you know, that continuity that really, really helps. And, um, you know, that identity that, again, you're trying to, uh, you know, persist with. Uh, You know, for us, obviously, that's a a different situation. If uh, there's a lot of kind of revolving parts uh, Mm. through the, you know, the early years. But uh, next question. One one more point. Sorry. Yeah, no one point real quick. Like, if, you know, this season, I think we understand the caveats as to why we're struggling. I think if we're back here next season, though, like, you know, with these same struggles, then I would definitely be worried. But in terms of long term, I'm not too worried about the future of the club at the moment. Right. Uh, I echo that for sure. Uh, Next question comes from Luis Salas 9967. Is it necessary to hire a technical director for the team? Just to address that really quickly, I mean, a technical director, do you mean Carlos Bocanegra? Because that's his uh, his role on the team. But uh, if you mean uh, he's not been acting like a technical director and that uh, we need to hire, hire uh, someone more experienced or something like that, I don't know. But uh, we currently have a technical director on the team, and he is making very high-level decisions for this, uh, this club. But... Um, 
I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, whether or not Boca Negra has been doing the job, I think it's discussion to be had. You know, I think mm -hmm. there's an argument to where you could say Tata was the real architect. And yes, they executed the moves that, you know, that as a team. But, uh, you know, since Tata left, has it been a little bit shaky? Sure. I mean, like, I think you and I are on the same page in terms of giving the front office a little benefit of the doubt, giving them a chance to rectify you know what's happening now but again like kind of what i just said like if we're still struggling you know a year from now 18 months from now and so on then i think his seat's gonna be real warm if not hot yeah uh and yeah also maybe darren eels uh part of that conversation a little bit as well because he he makes sure. some of these decisions but uh last question comes from uh, t steel 48 what should Atlanta's short and long-term goals be with how the season is going? Uh, we'll, we'll try to get through this one fairly quickly. It's a fairly nuanced question as well, but what do you think? Um, short, yeah, short-term, I think, making the playoffs. You know, uh, long-term, um, you know, just get back, getting back to the identity that we know this team to be, you know, uh, with the playing style, with being one of the better teams in the league, I think, uh, you know, and that obviously a lot of, a lot has to be done in terms of bringing a manager and addressing the roster. But I think, uh, yeah, I think that's more or less it. Yeah, no, that's well said. Um, I think another, yeah, maybe long-term goal is, uh, you know, making sure that we are a trophy winning side as well. Again, I mean, that's kind of been part of the identity as well. Uh, definitely, you know, in terms of uh, how, how much kind of swagger we're showing on our social media you know you kind of want to get back to that type of um you know that type of optic and so it's something that uh, hopefully we do get back to soon but anyway that does it for the mailbag and thank you everyone who sent in questions and uh yeah make sure to send your questions through ig story in the future to possibly get your question answered so let's get to the match preview, and we're playing Inter Miami again. And it's uh, Saturday, September 19th on, at 7 p.m. at the Benz, shown locally on Fox Sports South, uh, or Fox Sports Southeast, more specifically. But uh, yeah, uh, LA United are looking to get in the win column against Inter Miami because our past two meetings we of course drew nil nil and then had that 2-1 loss so we will be really looking to make sure that uh you know we at least in hopefully i mean if we play them one more time then okay maybe but if this is the last time we play them we cannot be uh you know shut out in the win column against an expansion side but uh so uh yeah it will be uh, in terms of yeah inter miami they maybe have some attacking help along the way, but uh, it uh, there are some issues in terms of uh, not only his visa, but also uh, you know when he can actually come. But uh, yeah, Gonzalo Iguain, the uh, Igua uh, the Juventus striker, they at least have already mutually terminated their contract together, and so uh, he is on his way. It's just a matter of when for them. But uh, at least we will not be facing him on Saturday. I think that's very much at least known. Uh, so in the current form, Miami, they, uh, they've they won two in the last six, uh, lost two, drawn two. We, unfortunately, have only won one. Uh, and we've, of course, lost our last two. But also we've lost three in our last six with two draws. So we're, uh, we're kind of in a little bit of a free fall at the moment in terms of trying to get uh, maximum points. It's been a difficulty for sure. But uh, yeah, you know, getting to the standings, uh, Inter Miami are still in last place, but, uh, and then we are in 10th. It's, uh, you know, somehow we're just still, you know, they, they got that win against us, but it really didn't bring them up that much further because obviously they had a pretty awful start to their season in losing I think what uh you know they, they went one and six to start the season essentially so you know it's uh it's one of those things where yeah we're we're kind of mired in this uh kind of we're mediocre they're very 
very bad, if not the, the worst team in the league. And, uh, yeah, we need to do a lot better when we face them, for sure. But uh, getting into their players to watch, uh, Blaze Matuidi, their new uh, <coughs> defensive midfielder, of course, uh, played against us last match. Uh, I mean, yeah, he has helped solidify them and, uh, you know, definitely has brought more energy into their midfield. Uh, Pissarro, their attacking midfielder, yeah, I mean... He's been a busy guy against us for sure. Uh, LGP, of course, uh, you know, a guy that's been a thorn in our side now, uh, in a sense. Uh, just fouling Barco whenever he can, and arguably should have been sent off that last match he played against us. But he's uh, he's quickly becoming the uh, the lovable prick for Inter Miami, and. Uh, <laughs> For everybody else, <laughs> this is what it's like being on that on that side of it. It is, it is. Uh, which we knew, and it's just one of those like we didn't know what it was like on the other side exactly. Now we know. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, for Atlanta, if you're an Inter Miami fan, as uh, some of them have uh, said hello in the past on uh, our social media, so uh, maybe they're watching. Uh, Ezekiel Barco is kind of the, the lone DP in the squad right now, and he's been tasked with pretty much igniting this offense. Uh, Brooks Lennon is a guy that's been solid for us, but if not, uh, he hasn't really been uh, spectacular in any sense. But I think something, uh, I think, you know, he can, he can even up his level, I think, uh, you know, while he's, uh, you know, starting and, playing so many games. Uh, but Jurgen Dom, Eric Torres, or Kubo Torres are a couple of dudes that are, uh, yeah, I think vying for, I think, starting spots in this team. But, yeah, two Mexican players that uh, I think have a lot to play for, really. And so hopefully they start showing what they can do. Uh, Dom has been pretty effective uh, so far off the bench. But uh, hopefully he can show a little bit more. George Bello, obviously guy that we talked about at the earlier part of the show but uh yeah it's been i think more more than uh not i think a delight to see him grow uh throughout the season so uh yeah you know in terms of danger men for us it's uh you know we have a lot of hopefuls at the moment more so than mm -hmm. real danger men but uh let's get into the injuries and availability for both Squads, Georgia Costa is still out their midfielder, and as is David Norman Jr. And uh, defender Denso Ulysse is also out as well. Of course, Joseph Martinez is out for us, and Eric Lopez's availability is still unknown. And Fernando Mesa has been training with the squad, so and he was in the 20 as well last match, so maybe he does play a part. We will find out, uh, but let's get into the quotes where uh, the team talked a little bit before the match. And so George Bello said, it's really frustrating not winning games. Football is all about winning, and we are not doing that at the moment, but that is football, and we have to keep our heads up. This is the time where we can't crumble, blame each other, or go against each other. This is a time where we really need to come together and look at what we're doing wrong. We need to stay with each other through these tough times or through these times. Like I said, football has tough times, and this is really when we need to lock in and do things together and be together as one. So it looks like, yeah, at least, uh, you know, you know, a young kid has his head on uh, screwed on right. And so, uh, you know, hopefully the rest of the team gets on with that message as well and really fights in this match to be able to get three points. But let's get into the uh, opponent's 11 and the previous 11s and possibly what we might see, uh, you know, for them against us. So, uh, yeah, their, uh, their last match, they had uh, Robles again, or in between the sticks, Ben Sweat, LGP, uh, Reyes and Figal in the back line, Matuidi and Ujoa in midfield. Aguadello, Pissarro, Morgan in the attacking midfield positions, and Robbie Robinson up top. And yeah, I mean, against us last time, it was uh, Robles in the same back line, uh, Ujoa, Chapman, uh, and it was Shea, Pissarro, Morgan, and Robinson up top. Of course, uh, 
uh, Morgan uh, had the brace against us. So yes, he is someone that we will be looking to nullify as well in this match. But yeah, I mean, they really could. They've been rotating against us a good bit, but Shea has been playing on that left side. I don't know. It, it must seem like, uh, you know, they uh, they feel like they can rotate against us, which is a little bit troubling, but uh, and uh, not put out I there. I mean, the key man is... Yeah. Key man's Pisado. You know, I yeah, mean, he's definitely. been running these matches, so... Yeah, we need to have someone shadow him and shadow him hard in, in order to uh, mm -hmm. to maybe really nullify their attack. But let's get into our predicted starting 11. So let's get through the lines together. What do you think? Look, is I'm between the sticks, of course. Uh, on my back line, I have a four-man back line. I have Escobar, Miles. This has been training. I, if he can go, I think he gets a start. If not, it's going to be walks there again for me and then Bello. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, I think because uh, how we've been playing in a four-man back line, it's, it, yeah, maybe slightly attacking earlier uh, when we were playing it, but now it's still kind of the same. We kind of need some solidity in the back. And with Mesa... Uh, yeah, having uh, you know been training, I think that we put in a three-man back line here, uh, have a little bit more of the familiarity, but still it's very attacking throughout the rest of the lineup. Uh, so for me, it's Escobar, Robinson, and Mesa in the back line. For you in midfield? Yeah, three-man midfield. Uh, Josetu, Remedi, Hyman, I think, has been our most effective combination. You mentioned somebody to shadow Pisaro. I think uh, that will be Remedi's main task. And I think if he can do that, that'll go a long way towards us getting a result out of this match. Right. I mean, he has shown that ability to do that in the past against like maybe the likes of Maxi Morales. Um, you know, he's, uh, you know, for NYCFC in the playoffs i think that's something that uh he is capable of doing and could help us uh gain control of this match but uh yeah for me in midfield um uh, i think it's a 3-5-2 for me so i think you know in mid or as the wing backs it would be lennon and Bello, and uh in central midfield essentially would be Heinemann, remedi and hosetu uh probably hosetu being a little bit more of the you know forward one there although maybe Heinemann could be as well i think they'll interchange but i think uh there's the most ball retention here maybe in a sense but also uh that ability to maybe man mark and hopefully remedi can do that against pisaro but uh let's get into your forwards yeah uh it's gonna be lennon torres and barco and so i have yeah i have kubo torres starting um, with Adam John off the bench, an option, of course. If Dom is healthy, because he did have to come off early, um, I think he'll get some minutes as well. But I think we start off with uh, right footed Lennon on the right and then Barco on the left doing this thing where he cuts in. Right. Uh, yeah, so, and for me, it's, uh, it's you know, a two man four line in that sense. And so Barco and Torres, uh, yeah, I think we'll be tasked with uh, hopefully. Uh, you know, getting our attack going in uh, in that sense, putting the ball in the back of the nets. I think relieving Barco maybe a little bit of some responsibility going backwards might help uh, his game going forward in a kind of role that he's familiar with and has had some success in. So possibly, you know, this might be uh, something to just kind of, you know, maybe one time in terms of formation uh, to kind of wake up everybody and uh, get them in the best positions to be able to succeed. So, uh, you know, we shall see. But, uh, you know, in terms of what we would like to see the team do in this game, for me, I would like to see them attack quickly, move the ball faster, and score early in this match because, as we've seen, if they go down, it's been a little bit of a difficulty for them to come back recently. Uh, and the heads kind of go, go down a little bit. But uh, we need to be more stout defensively on set-piece situations, dead ball situations, and we need to create more chances, take more risks, and, uh, yeah, really just go forward with, you know, a little bit less abandon. Basically, take the handbrake off a little bit. But uh, And I think maybe a key that hasn't really happened for us much this season, but if we get a penalty, choose beforehand who will be taking it before the match. What about you? <laughs> yeah, that did come up, didn't it? Um, I think, I really think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think uh, especially 
when we get the ball up to the final third, you know, I would love to see like Barco and others taking players on, you know, and get don't go don't slow down, don't go backwards, don't go sideways, like get the ball into the box. You know, I think that's really uh where I think we're missing that incisiveness. And so I'd like to see the forwards be a little more aggressive. Definitely. So uh, let's get into the odds quickly. Uh, according to Bet MGM, Atlanta United has a 45.5% chance to win this match, a draw at 28.6%, and Inter Miami at 33.3%. So yeah, we're at home. Uh, even you know, disregarding form, I think they also look at the table as well. Uh, yeah, we are favorites. So let's do the business. So let's get to our score prediction. With all that being said, Mark, what do you think? Uh, I think it's going to be a 1-1, you know, I think, so Miami is three points behind Atlanta right now, and, you know, if they get the win, they would leave Frog Atlanta in the standings and push us out of a playoff spot. I think it's of utmost important that we get a result out of this match um, for the standings and for confidence sake as well. Um, and so I think that we could see a slightly more conservative approach from both teams in this game well more for more so from atlanta but i think it ends up being a 1-1 match gotcha uh for me i think uh i think we can get it together especially if um you know we are playing at home and we change things up a little bit uh maybe allow them to be on the ball a little bit more uh you know maybe force some mistakes out of them just be a little bit more aggressive i think we can get the results and I think it's a 2-1 win for us. But guys, let us know what you think is going to be the score in the comments below. That's the match preview and pretty much the entire show except for the question of the day. And the question of the day is, how many years do you think Brad Guzan has left in him for Atlanta United? Let us know in the comments below. Very interested in what you have to say. So guys, that's the entire show. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. And for Mark, I'm AJ. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Yeah!